Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world. It's time to experience the O's on the original sports podcast. Hey, Youngie, what's up, my man? It's It's happy hour. It's happy hour. I'm happy. Yeah, it's my hour. Uh, Yeah. Seniors are gone. (laughs) Seniors are gone. Three weeks Hey, listen, we got a three-day weekend, baby. Summer's right around the corner. We are in summer mode. (laughs) Yes, sir. You coming out the crib tomorrow? Better believe it. Yeah, what time are you going to be here? Uh, I'll bring my... I'll bring my bathing suit and swimming floaties. Okay. Things kick off at four. Four? Yeah. The I'm chicken's like, marinated. The burgers are thawing. I might have to get there a little early because I know the yeah. beer will be gone quick. <laughs> I hit Sam's Club today. Dropped a cool 150 on like odds and ends because everything else was bought. Why don't the Sam's and Costco's up here sell beer like they do in Virginia or, you know, we go down to Florida. They got... They got more beer there than the beer stores here. <clears throat> yeah, well, they, I'm, you, know, I'm, you well, think they, they want to cash in, huh? Oh, huh, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. These people in Maryland. Sell what a state. Up. I just uh, I saw news. this article. Go ahead. Go ahead. What was you saying? I just saw the news talking about uh, uh, beer and stuff. The sales of marijuana are, are superseding the sales of beer and alcohol. Good Lord. In the last couple of months. Well, that's not hard to see because, I mean, I think people would rather, you, you know, you can go to a, a dispensary. There's, I pass one every day on the way. I pass two on the way to work. You could go there, tell them I'm having trouble sleeping. What do they do? They give you something to help you sleep. You can go there and tell them, you know, I, I'm having anxiety. They'll give you something to help you with that. If you don't want to smoke, you can do a gummy. You don't want to do a gummy, you need a chocolate chip cookie or a brownie. You know, like... <laughs> They've got yeah. that down to a science today, and it's it just insane. Seems like, the, is there that many more people doing it? Is it the cost of it? Like to say that the sales have gone way more than alcohol seems well. To be the other significant, and which is insane because alcohol is pretty expensive today. Yeah, because you buy craft beers. I like these. Uh, I like these mango seltzers at our, one of our places we love to go to, Rockwell Brewery. Uh, he's got two locations, the one on East Street in Frederick, and then he's got the one on uh, Riverside Avenue, which I'm going to tonight. They have a really good band, uh, the Curly Brothers. But anyway, uh, you know, it's still, I, I like these mango seltzers because I'm not a big beer guy anymore. And there, I got four of them for like, you know, like 13 bucks or something crazy. You know, That's- it's... Uh, that's actually not bad. No. And they're good. Like, they're good. I can drink two of those and uh, I feel pretty good and t- it takes the edge off and I'm that's it. I won't drink any more of them. Uh-huh. That's on like a Tuesday, though. No, I'm playing, oh. I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. <laughs> you only have two. <laughs> you only have two. And then the other two, and then you have to go get four more. Yeah. Good thing to write up a street. That's all yeah, I can, you can tell you. You can walk. You can walk. Yeah. Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. Hey, Yogi, one of the awesome. oldest sports known to man will be featured on our show this happy hour afternoon, Friday, May 24th of the year 2024. Um, our guest is ultra successful Michael Rabel. Uh, yes, that Michael Rabel of the Premier Lacrosse League fame. Uh, he's going to talk to us about him and his brother, Paul Rabel, who was the number one dog in lacrosse for years and years until he actually retired. Um, how they've made a household name out of lacrosse, or they're working very hard to do so. Uh, it's a sport that, you know, it, it's really taken off. It's definitely the state sport here in Maryland. Mm-hmm. Uh, the plan is going forward to continue to grow this thing. Uh, if you've never watched lacrosse, I highly recommend it. Imagine playing hockey on air with a football complement to it to a certain degree. Um, it's a very skilled sport. You have to be in great shape. Um, we're excited to learn a lot more about America's fastest growing sport because I really feel like it's the fastest growing sport. What do you think? Oh, definitely. It's it's taken off. And my son plays in the past three years, and it's grown a lot. The tournament, the summer leagues, the tournaments, everything. 
it, it's just like you said, it's amazing to watch. And one of the oldest sports, it dates back to the 1100s, 12th century. The Native Americans played it, and just how yeah. it's evolved. Europeans developed, uh, obviously, and then uh, coming. It's primarily on the East Coast. Now, Mike will share with us how they expanded it out west so that they can have an east and west during conference for the PLL. But it's it's fun as hell to watch. Like you said, it, it combines a lot of different sport with hockey, football. There's a little basketball component when you got over and back. I know they don't probably call it. They don't call it that. But um, they do. And it's it's rare that it happens. It happens more at the at the youth and early yeah. high school level. But but it's it's I love it because it's fast paced, um, like hockey. There's hitting, you know, and it, it's engaging. The only thing is when you get one of those teams, especially I'm, I'm speaking of the high school experience, that's very dominant, like Urbana, who just won the four uh, A state championship this week there that was a phenomenal team and they get up on somebody it's like they they score at will and it's like face off pass pass shoot score you just do that over and over again it kind of demoralizes the other team yeah, that's kind of hard because you got you a got lot of kids yeah oh. but you got with the with the dimensions of the field you're playing on the football size field you know in a little extra room going behind the goalies and whatnot. It, it, it's just so spread out. It's hard to cover that area. Mm-hmm. And when they attack that zone and you got shooters rocketing that ball and you got the goalie back or a chest pad and, and a cup, no other pads. He's like just saying, shoot it. I mean, it's just wild. Those goalies are like the sacrificial lamb. It's amazing. I don't- I don't think those kids. Uh, I don't think those kids who play just started playing though. You know, like these kids. It's kind of like uh, Vincent's hockey team. These kids, probably about eight or nine of them, kids have gone on to what they think are greener pastures for whatever reason. But the, these kids have played together on this. We call it a select team. We play like six tournaments, five tournaments a year, and. They played so long together that they beat teams at the A level, even though they only practice about, uh, I don't know, five or six times an entire year together. But they know each other so well throughout the course of time that they just, you know, and and that sounds like exactly what you get in Urbana uh, with those kids. And and that's the thing with these programs. You, You have to have a feeder program, you know. Yeah, uh, that, and that's just like anything: youth football, youth, youth baseball, um, wrestling, any of these sports. You have to have a feeder program to attract, to develop, and to promote to the next level. Yeah, yep. I'll be interested in talking to Mike and asking him. Well, here's here's a couple of interesting tidbits. I had no idea. Oh, there he is. I'm gonna I'm gonna get right after him. What's going on, Mister Rabel? Yo, yo, what's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> I was just getting ready to tell the story about how you taught me lacrosse. Huh. Dude, Do we have the same that? haircut now. We have the same haircut Yeah, now, <laughs> except you're a hell of a lot younger than me, Michael. Uh, a you lot good, younger than me. You better look good. too. <laughs> hey, listen. Do you remember teaching me the game, you and Paul and those guys back in the day? I had no clue what I was doing. I was just this country bumpkin from Western PA who knew football. Yeah, that's all right. We just needed someone who could like go out there and and sort of give a give a fuck about us, you know. <laughs> yeah, I did. I loved you guys, man. Uh, I I tell you what, my my favorite kids have always been from Watkins Mill. Really? Did I coach? Did I? Yeah, it's hard. It, it's incredible. That? It's Why incredible. I I don't know. You guys, your personalities, your connection. Uh, I talked to so many kids from Watkins Mill from the whole way back to when you were there. Uh, up to when I left in the mid 2000s and, and went to Rockville, I it just there's something about the kids from there, the young people from there, just were easy to build a long term relationship. Joey with. Hook, uh, Joey Hooks works very hard. Love with Joey. The young he's one of the best people that's still active in it. Yeah, he pushes. Yeah, it. he works very hard at it. You know, I played with him. Joey and I played together. 
Matter of yeah, fact, was, my son with the 480 Club, my son goes to Seneca and he works with Joey. They go over to Watkins Mill Elementary behind there and they mentor a bunch of uh, elementary school kids. So he's he's doing a lot of good stuff down there. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. No, man. He's, if there was like, if we could get like stamp out like 10 more Joey's, yep. it would help. It would help yep. for sure. Absolutely. He's yeah. done so much for so many of those kids, Eric. Mike, why'd you end up choosing going to Dartmouth? <laughs> Dude, I was just telling this story to someone today because um, someone over at ESPN who uh, has an intern is going to Dartmouth next year. And man, it was honestly, um, well, speaking of Watkins Mill, uh, there was a Spanish teacher, I forget what her name was. She went to Dartmouth. So she was like, hey, you have pretty good grades. Um, you're, uh, you're pretty good at football. And I heard your mom is, you know, helping really push the school and recording your so back up it's backing up a second my mom actually uh we didn't have the re, uh, the football team varsity football yep. we were a good football team won a state championship i think our second year there walked in a while i yes. wasn't there yep. i mean we weren't recording the games all of the games we didn't have film and so my mom uh i guess the, the rumor sort of spilled through that she was paying one of the guys from saint john newman the catholic church that we all went to uh, to go and stand there with a recorder and then he would print those on a DVD. She would take them, put in an envelope and send them to all of these Ivy league schools. And then she was talking to the career services and was like, I think Mike can look at an Ivy league school. He has pretty good grades um, tested fine. And his uh, he's pretty good at football. And, um, and, and then sort of like she heard about it. She came to me that my mom was, was doing this. And I was like, Oh, and then there was uh uh, an assistant coach uh, on the football team, coach, um, he had an Italian last name. I forget what his name was. He had this, uh, he was if maybe coach John something. He was only a couple what? of years. For... Was it Deanna? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike Deanna? Mike Deanna, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he comes to me and he goes, hey, I heard your mom sending tapes out to Brown and to Dartmouth and to Princeton. And I was like, yeah, but coach, I don't want to, I want to go to William and Mary because Chris Kimber went there. I yeah, I remember Kimber went there. Yeah, I want to play at Maryland, you know, um, Villanova or something, something local. And he goes, let me tell you something. <laughs> this is like this crazy, like how important it is to you know the work you're talking about, like Joey's doing or getting in front of a high school kid. He was like, let me t tell you something. If you uh, have a chance to go to an Ivy League school, you should do it. If you get in, yeah. I'll tell you why. And then he was like, one day you and your buddies from, from Dartmouth are going to be sitting around. And this sticks in my head. Sitting on leather couches, smoking <laughs> cigars, talking about the investments you're making and the businesses you're building together. And I was like, man, I don't know anything about that. And I, but like that, he was able to illustrate and tell a story that mm -hmm. literally stuck in my head that immediately elevated those schools ab above other schools. Mm -hmm. um, and then Dartmouth showed a lot of interest and, and um, they were like all over it, came and visited me. And Ended up going and visiting it. I remember getting on the a flight on Southwest flight from BWI. My mom was like, I was like, Mom, I can't, I'm not flying to, Dart to college. I'm just going to drive to college like all of my other friends. She's like, shut up. You have a chance to go to the school. They might get you in, you idiot. Uh, she didn't say that, but she was just like, we're going. And then it got there and just, it was magical. And um, it was like one of those things that it was just luck of my mom really pushing me. Um, and those, those stories of the Spanish teacher approaching me and the assistant football coach, you know, telling the story of what it could be portrayed in my mind. And, and honestly, man, like, um, I remember when I accepted and, you know, told people we were going, I was going to Dartmouth, I, people walking to know were making fun of me. They were like calling it Dartmouth. No one had ever heard of it. So I kind of have this weird love hate thing with, with Watkins Mill. Cause it was, it was well, tough right there. there. Yeah. But at the same time, it made me tough. Like I said, so. I feel so lucky what are, to go there. you chose there because the guy painted a picture and you just saw yourself there. You fell in love. Where, where else were you getting looks to play ball? Uh, well, William and Mary said I could walk on. They weren't they they weren't going to offer me a scholarship, so they they're going to get me in if I want to walk on. I was like, I, don't, I, don't, I want a scholarship. Uh, uh, Georgetown was like pretty big. Cornell made an offer. Um, let's see, uh, Cornell, what was Lehigh, like a bunch of, and then like some D3 NESCAC schools. Um, and you said your grades were going like this. I don't think you're well, going to start out 4 0. First two years, I had a 4 0. 
<laughs> and then I finished with like a three six, so uh, in high school, and so they did go down. It was like three eight, three six. That had nothing to do with hanging out with Kimber, who was a crazy man himself. Had everything to do to hang out with Kimber. That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the best athletes I ever remember. Uh, not oh, necessarily man. coaching because I was now. doing a lot of JV, but man, he was he was tremendous, wasn't he? I tried to get him to convert. I tried to get him to transfer to Dartmouth, and that was before the portal, but way easier because he wasn't getting that much burn at William and Mary. And I was like, dude, you could come tear it up at Dartmouth because Princeton, I made and Harvard both made him offers. Um, and Ivy League, he would have been an amazing Ivy League football player, but he was already locked in, so he couldn't get him. Mike, did he end up going to military? Mm-hmm. He's still in the Marines. Yeah, I just talked to him this weekend. Actually, I was on the phone with him. Yeah, he's still in the Marines. Yeah, he's still. Oh, he's God still bless him. Reserve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's That's great. That's amazing. Yeah. All right, so guys, we're here with the CEO, founder of the PLL. You went to Dartmouth, played football. Mike, yeah. why not lacrosse? Or what made like? Did you have any? Uh, yeah. Power struggle there. Saying, nah, I want to do this, that, or. What made you decide? I totally did, man. Well, see, the thing about um, we got—I just noticed we got to get you guys some uh, some gear, some PLL gear for for your backgrounds. I'm gonna <laughs> That's send definitely. You guys, I'm going to send you guys some merch. I, I was looking for my whip snake shirt. I do have uh, one. You want some whip snake <laughs> stuff? All right, I got you some Maryland whip snake stuff. DC right, so. baby, please tell me you're not a Redwoods fan now, right? <laughs> I don't know, man. I can't be a fan for a team. I got to root for them all, right? All of them, um, yeah. At the league level, I guess. Yeah. I guess. Um, so I, you know, look. When I was, you know, I was, I was better at football earlier than I was at lacrosse, and then I got good at lacrosse, and then it was my senior spring. Like, really, I was really good at lacrosse my senior spring. Not really good, but like, you know, I'm all uh, second team all met, first team all Gazette, all that stuff, and yeah. all American USA all American, and and. Um, I was already committed to Dartmouth. You know, I committed my my um, uh, senior senior end of the senior fall, so senior winter. Yeah. I think I committed, and then you know I was just got like really in shape, and we had like great guys like Coach Mark, and we had another coach. I forget what his name was. He was a former Green Beret, and he came down there. Remember him? Yeah, dude was an air traffic controller. Is that what he was? He did something. Yeah, he, he was, was an air traffic controller. Dude, he got us in shape, and yeah. I just had a great, great. Uh, we had a great senior year run, and I, I was, I, you know, look. The thing about football, the difference between football and lacrosse, um, is I loved playing lacrosse. I never loved playing football. That's I was interesting. Good you say at, that. I was good at football. Football is. Um, and maybe I'm just soft. So like, I would be interested in having some people on and you're hearing from your guys. You know, Mark, you played football, but, um, football, I was like before, at least in college and even in high school, man, it was just like, I would get so much stress before games. Mm. So you're playing lineman and you're, I played D tackle at Dartmouth, like it was 300 pounds. I would be studying these guys all day long and you watch their film, you know what they look like, you know, every their height, their weight. And then you go up and you Stand across them for three and a half hours and you're in a fist fight. You're just fighting. Yep. And that's intense, man. I mean, I know we have helmets and stuff on, but boom, and it's just on all game long. Where lacrosse is there's some hitting, but it's team game. It's like fun. It's fluid. It's about who's more athletic. It's just more strategy. It's it's a beautiful game and it's really a team game. And in football, you know, I can have an amazing game as a D tackle and we could lose by, you know. Uh, either a field goal or by 10 points. And it doesn't really matter because it's just people are yeah. like, do your job. When lacrosse, it's it's hard for like one person to really kind of take over. So yeah. um, I always felt that I loved playing lacrosse. And so then what happened was after my senior year, the coach at Dartmouth called, uh, the lacrosse coach called the football team and was like, hey, I heard you got some guy as a US, USA lacrosse All-American. Um, you know, maybe we can talk about splitting him. He's already in the school. And he never reached out to me, but I got an immediate call from our football coaches and we're like, Hey, you're not thinking about playing lacrosse, are you? And I was like, Oh, you know, I haven't really gotten to that, but I love it. And he was like, no, nah, we got you into school for football. <laughs> you're playing football oh, wow. and you're not doing both. And so that was kind of the story. But I, after, during spring ball practices, when the lacrosse team was practicing, I would go with my pads and sit down and watch the guys play and pick up a stick and play with them. Like 
Well, I still have my football pads on. It was fun. <laughs> Mike, I, I remember you lost quite a bit of weight between your last yeah. season of football and when we played lacrosse that year. You Good were memory, a long ball. Yeah, yeah, you lost quite Crazy, a bit man. of weight. Yeah. yeah. How the hell did you get that, that back? Dude, yeah. I'm still trying to do well, that. Well, hey, that? hey, brother, as you get older, yeah. it won't go away. It just comes back in droves. Bro, it's crazy. I got like fast. I'm like, you know, checking out my macros. I'm trying to get my steps in with a weighted vest. It's just like constant trying to keep the weight off. And then you peek over your shoulder at Paul and he's all sleek, still six sleek, pack looking dude. Full head, full head of hair. Yeah, it's just a mess, man. But you're the brains. Yeah, I don't know brains. about that. I don't know about that. What so tell me about this show. How long you guys been doing it? Like, what's the tell hype? Let me let me understand this show. Hype it up for me. Okay, so we've been doing the original sports podcast with Mark Meriday and the Barbershop crew for probably a year and a half. I started nice. out doing this in 2020. Um, we went on COVID. And I, yeah, I remember you always wanted to do yeah. communications. Yeah. And I yeah. always wanted to do communications. And uh, I couldn't do it. My wife said, you're such a big bullshitter. Why don't you try a podcast? And <laughs> it just took off. Like, it took off for me. And I've had like a boatload of guests. I've had a boatload of people come on with me. Um, we've had we're we're all over the place now. We have a Roku station that we're on uh, yeah. through Elite, uh, yeah, through Elite Sports Network, Elite Sports and Entertainment Network. Um, yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we just locked in a guy for golf. Uh, we got a guy coming on from the Indianapolis Indians to talk about Paul Skeens, the number one number one pitcher in Major League Baseball who just came up for the Pittsburgh Pirates. We, we're having a lot of fun with it. Uh, normally, there's two other guys on with us, but they're away this weekend. One is at uh, Cooperstown, ironically. He is at the uh, – his uncle was in the Negro Leagues, and he's in the Hall of Fame, and they were having like a ceremony up there. And the other guy, well, he went camping. You'd love that guy, man. What a personality Chops has. <laughs> but that that's where yeah. we are. We, we just got – we just made our summer it. schedule. Yeah, I love it. This is yeah. great, man. Just I love, love the vibe sports. you guys have. Just love talking sports. Appreciate you coming on here, man. This is awesome. I feel like I'm in. I'm sure you guys are that person. I feel like you're. It's like a comfortable setting. You guys, you know, as talent, set that setting. But it, it feels like you know, approachable, comfortable, not like an uptight you know podcast that's trying to grind me out. So no, you we we don't want to hear you do that. I don't need to hear you. <laughs> Terry doesn't need to hear you do that. In fact, Michael. We're going to a local distillery on Sunday, McClintock's, and we're talking uh, guys who played professional sports that are vets. Oh, That's cool. Our, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to do it on location at, at McClintock's Distillery. If you're if you're a vodka or a gin drinker, I highly recommend these guys. They're in downtown Frederick. But uh, if you it's always a lot of fun. Bottle, let us know your favorite. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Absolutely. We'll Absolutely. We have a, there's a bunch of PLL guys who um, – unfortunately um for our country they've had to but unfortunately for the league because we because naval academy and the army have big lacrosse programs so we'll draft them they'll play for us like a year or two and then they have to go on active duty and sometimes we've had them like johnny Serdic, he was army one of the great defensemen he's active duty uh, brendan nick turn we just drafted him a couple of years ago he's had to go active duty he was from army and we've even had guys uh, like Matt Landis. He was a defenseman for the Redwoods. He is now a, a Navy SEAL, right? Um, <clears throat> there's guys who who just played professionally with us and um, end up becoming active duty. And if we can get them back, you know, that would yeah. be great. But yeah, that's a really cool story to tell. I'm glad you guys are doing it. Yeah, we got to get these guys back. We got to get this sport rolling, man. It's beautiful. Like I said, the kids play and – um, just got an email today from Marcus Holman or yeah, Holman. He's doing a camp here in Olney. Uh, does that ring a bell? Coach, what's his name? Holman, Marcus Holman. Marcus Holman. Yeah. Yeah, man. He plays in it for the cannons, Boston cannons. Yeah. 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 I was like, really? <laughs> he's doing a camp in, in Olney. Yeah, I guess he lives in Baltimore. Um, yeah. So, classic. Yeah. So yeah, he's great. I'm going to sign my son up. I'm going to sign my son up to do that. Oh man, Marcus is fantastic. He he was used to be a coach at uh, at Utah too, um, where, and his dad now his dad was a coach. He's assistant coach, and his dad's now the coach of the Cannons. And uh, Tom Schreiber is going to help him out, and Jordan Wolf. Damn, all star lineup. Tom Schreiber's reigning MVP. Oh really? Yeah, of the league. Wow, yeah, I did not know that. Utah That's excellent, Mike. Yeah. Your sport 
your sport is going to a whole nother level because the more the more you watch and hear of all the drama and stuff and, and all the other sports, the more it turns me off. Yeah, it, it really does. I, I mean, I, I, I keep talking to my son about watching lacrosse. We watch it on TV. You know, um, he's deep into playing baseball and ice hockey, but cool. you know, I, I enjoy it. I think it's a very fast sport. It's got so many dynamic aspects of it. Um, that, that year you, that I coached with you guys, like that was one of the best years I've ever coached anything. That was so fun. My problem was I was an intense son of a bitch back then. I'm a little more mellow now as I've gotten older. A little bit. Not, <laughs> not really. That didn't matter. We like that. I think high school yeah. kids need uh, – I think, you know, I don't know if you guys know the stats, but I think I saw a stat that was like 30 to 40% of – of uh, maybe, maybe it was around 30% of um, high school teachers are, are, are male. And, you know um, – you know, we, and especially me speaking from a young boy's perspective in high school, I was, you know, obviously great dad and he was around and, and, but like having more of a, you know, especially in the field male presence there to, to be a, a voice of uh, authority, but also a seriousness and um, compassion. And I, I always remembered you as someone that would be serious, took it really seriously, intense, but then could pull, pull us to the side and have a conversation. And, and, you know, that's, that's really valuable. I think at that age, you know, 15, 14 to 18, you're really in a formidable part of, of just sort of understanding the world. And as a young, young boy, you know, having men to be able to help you through that and teach you those life lessons on the field, I think is really important. And then you certainly did that for us. So I appreciate, I, that. I appreciate that. I, I really appreciate you saying that. I, I, I've always been very passionate about uh, helping young guys grow up. Um, yeah. Just uh, kids in general, but like I like watching young men grow up into good, strong men who are successful. I put a lot of time and effort into it still today uh, at my 26th year of teaching. I don't coach anymore because I have a boy who's uh, 14 and played multiple sports, but um it's interesting that you say that because from that perspective, uh, we need more people like that. You know, it's hard. It's hard work. coaching now, though. It's really hard because, like you said, he could lay into your ass, and you knew that he had your best interest at heart, right? But right. now you do that, and they're like, "Mom, you won't believe what the coach said," and mm -hmm. it wasn't out of any malicious intent. It was to motivate. It was to get you to your best game. It's right. it's it's change, man. It's it's tough. Right. Totally. It's, um, it's hard. It's hard to say. Everyone wants to, I remember every generate every like older generation always says the next generation right. isn't, isn't as tough or isn't, uh, as it works as hard, but yeah, it's hard for me to say, cause unless you're in those, like life is just different for that generation. They grew up differently. Right. Um, and I think that, that, that I, I, I don't disagree with you that it is, um, I've heard, especially the call from college coaches that coaching, um, you can't coach the, you know, sort of in that militaristic way or sort of like over authoritative, uh, yeah. tone in nature. You need to be a lot softer with the kids one, um, because that's just like the generation, um, two, they have leverage. They can transfer the next year if they don't like you and say, so NIL. NIL, right. And, and so maybe it's a good thing, but at the same time, I remember, I remember, and I sound like such an old head when I say this stuff, but like Coach V, who was our our, our line coach, right? He was like yep. you know, a guy that wasn't the most warm and, and fuzzy, but you just had respect for him. And I remember when Eric Knoll went down in our playoffs, went on to Penn State and was Gatorade Player of the Year, and yeah, he went down in our playoffs and tore his scapula. And I had to go in, and, and they were, I think we lost to Severna Park, and they had this like linebacker that was, just, I just couldn't block him. He was like all state linebacker. And it was like one of those things where it was like, it was like me trying to go and block like a Darnell docket. It's just like not going to really happen. And, and like, you only could, Eric Knoll was the only one who could do it. And we lost that game. And, and uh, it was my sophomore year. And I wrote a letter to coach V and I just like wrote this long letter after that. I feel like I literally lost the game. And, uh, and I was just like, so disappointed. And like, anyway, I think it was a good for our relationship, but, I wonder if, uh, if if the sort of next gen of kids feels that way when they have a bad game, they can feel the weight of it and what the relationship is with coaches. Yeah, uh, I, I just generally be interested because I'm not on the coaching side; I'm more on the business side. But I, I do you know coaching pro. I spent we spent a lot of time with our our head coaches and pros at the PLL. 
it's a different dynamic than coaching high school and college. I don't know what you guys think. Uh, I got to be honest with you. Coaching kids today is done with kid gloves. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I can't do it, Mike. I just can't. I can't do it. I'm not a kid glove kind of guy. I don't have to yell and scream anymore because I'm so knowledgeable about what I'm doing. I don't have to get my point across like that. If you can't do it, you can go ahead and sit down over there. I don't care. I'll get somebody else that at least wants to try. But it, it's all about kid gloves with kids today. I think Terry hit it right on the nose that, you know, the kids are so sensitive that they'll run home and say, oh, coach got up my ass about whatever. And it's mm -hmm. not about getting up your ass. It's about making you want to be more productive as an athlete. Um, I My son has a 20-year-old coach on his travel team or his travel team. My son's 14, Mike. He has a guy six years older than him. And um, recently he's had a couple issues where the coach has just been like, no, you're going to the bench, but he's yelling it from the field. And my son's getting himself worked up. And I said, number one, if, you will, if you've if you done something that the coach doesn't agree with, he has every right to do that. He's the coach. Number two, you need to follow those directions. Don't give me any crap. And the coach is young. He doesn't have anybody guiding him. So he and I talked and I said, you know, here's some of the things you can do because I've done this forever. And he's like, I appreciate you just taking the time to teach me that. I think we have a lot of young coaches today. If you would come back to Montgomery County and you would see the age of some of these coaches coaching on the sidelines, head coaches, you would be like, holy shit, these guys are really young because none of the old dogs want to do it. There's so many laws and rules and so many stipulations that, yeah. that it's changed the dynamics of high school sports. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I hear you and I understand it. Um, yeah, it's it's just it's crazy how sports changes and, and it continues to change. You, you well, keep doing your that, thing there. That's really yeah. interesting. It the leadership position where you are and you, what's your involvement? You you started to say about your involvement with the coaches. Yeah. Do you do you have like just weekly, monthly meetings, or are you we, tell them? Yeah. All structure all that what do you do the way, the way that we structure things so you know the pll we own all eight teams we have we started with six we have eight so it would be like if the nba owned the teams but they didn't they didn't have individual owners so mm -hmm. um we own the league and the teams and the reason for that right now is it allows us to make faster and more strategic decisions from a business perspective that gives us scale gives us the ability to um make distribution changes, allows us to sell assets to sponsors, mm -hmm. uh, make investments in places that we think makes sense um, without having to jump through a bunch of red tape. Right. So, you know, if you have a bunch of different owners own a team, they have a say in league decisions because they own a percent of, of the league. They have, a, they have a lot of say in what their team does. They own certain assets versus what you own. They have to hit their schedule. You need to weave that into the broadcast partner. We start with the broadcast partner and we say, what are the best windows that we can justify giving to our league? And then let's position our schedule around that. Right. Rather yeah. than sort of trying to reverse engineer it and being like, here are the home away schedules for our team owners. What do you guys have? And that's a lot harder because then it's this big matrix on the back end of what fits, how do we prioritize our biggest things? So back to your original question, Terry, we have a team called um, lacrosse product um, and um, they uh, spend time and oversee Coaches, players, referees, mm. on field, um, integrity, uh, anything that has to do within uh, the field, on the field, and then also off the field, but with those constituents, yeah. they run, right? So it'll be like back end travel, making sure that, you know, hotels and food's adequate, all, e everything, right? We, we have to pay for all of that. Um, marketing deals, when we bring a player in as part of a sponsorship we sell, like everything goes through them. Um, they have, uh, weekly calls with coaches and then they do like monthly with all the coaches. Um, and it can be anything from, you know, making sure that they're communicating the way that we want them communicating with their teams or, or, you know, handling issues that they may have, or giving them updates on the company and the business and the league, um, adjustments, new rule changes, getting feedback, um, during the season, it's really intense, right? Cause you know, wins and losses happen. Sometimes stats, sometimes players are uh, upset or you know, there's have to be fines, right? So that's when it gets really, really intense in the communications. But essentially, uh, we try to be there for the coach. Like first couple of years, I was very, very involved because we didn't yeah. have a lacrosse product team. 
Yeah. It was just like me, me and Paul sort of managing it. And, um, I, you know, we were doing all the calls with the, with the, with the coaches and players and we've got a little bit more scale as we try to really focus on the commercial enterprise, but we still tap in and spend time with them because they have the responsibility. They're wearing two hats and we, and we, we decided this and we'll see how they continue to do it. They wear two hats. They're the coach, but they're also the GM. Okay. And that's hard to do. Not a lot of coaches can do that. Some coaches do it. You know, Belichick, you know, uh, Phil Jackson. It's tough. It's yeah. Tough because you got to be able to like coach the locker room and you're the one making the decisions around financial. Yeah. yeah. My could you model this after, because this is so unique from that perspective though. You don't see this with professional sports organizations. Um, it's, a, you know, we got the, we got the lucky benefit, man, of being able to do it after everyone else has kind of um, been in the space. Right. So, you know, we started in, in 2018, 2019, it's our first season, but 2018 is when we first raised money for it. We are students of sports of the sports industry. I think sports is, is really um, over the last, what I've seen 24 months, two years, call it becoming an investable asset class. When we got into it, it wasn't. <clears throat> Um, we were like really early and no one had really thought about, hey, you can invest in and own and think about a sports league and teams in a sport that has product market fit um, as an investable asset, just like you would think about. It's just like IP investing, like yeah. it's investing in a brand, it's investing in music, like people, there is there are consumers for it. Um, and now what you're seeing is, you know, uh, NBA takes on private equity money. The NFL is considering doing it. I think sports is becoming, it is becoming, I don't think it is, it is becoming an investable asset class of, of even um, not only just, um, you know, private equity and the private markets, but the public markets. Like you could go on the, the stock exchange right now and buy a chunk of Atlanta Braves if you wanted. You could buy a chunk sure. of F1 if you wanted with, yeah. with, um, Liberty Media owning both of those, but breaking them out into two separate stocks. You know, Man U, I think they're listed on the LSE. Um, I think you can even buy a piece of Chelsea. You're going to start to see yeah. more more of these asset classes as something that there's capital in um, and, and, and being invested in. So because of that, it's back to your question, and because of there's you know, more literature being written, we have the advantage of being able to read and trying to make certain decisions like we're tour based model, right? So yeah. NASCAR tours, F1 tours, WWE tours. We didn't create that, but we also looked at, okay, um, the advantages of those models and truly being single entity. We're the only team-based sport in North America. That's fully single entity. Every yeah. other team-based sport is owned by owners. WWE single entity, F1, it's a hybrid, um, PBR single entity, uh, uh, PGA is single entity. So a lot of individual sports, UFC, single entity. There's no team-based sports where there's teams that, that have single entity, but we think for right now, for our growth and trying to grow fast, um, it's, it's, it's advantageous. Do you see any teams getting at it in the near future? Selling teams? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's inevitable at some point we're gonna have to sell them. I mean, we raise money, we got to return capital, so it's one of the levers to be able to return capital is is selling teams for you know market price, and so that's why I'm really focused on trying to drive as, as much league revenue, not only so we can pay players more, but we can also justify you know the, the appropriate and market price for teams that then we can then you know offer to the marketplace and are a value to to you know sports owners. So, so I think it's inevitable. I, I don't know the timeline. No, Something hey, but you, on in the background, though. you your seven hundred twenty five dollar salary cap per team, right? Twenty five thousand, seven hundred twenty five thousand, seven hundred twenty five. That's a little 000. more than that. A little more. Plus, we have marketing addendums. It's it's actually okay. that's I think it's probably a dated number, but um, you know, we try we try to uh, we've been increasing it every year. We have a marketing addendum from the league as well. Um, the meaning like you know we have a like basically a slush fund that we. And, and with the players um, to to promote their teams in their league in the league, on top of those those uh, those those salary uh, is, budgets. Is that salary cap just for the players, or is that part of the coaching too? Just that's just that that's a that's a it's a budget. Um, <laughs> it's not really cap. 
Um, we try to work closely with our player advisory board to, to structure that and justify it. Um, but it is, uh, it's just for players. It's okay. separate one for, for coaches. Yeah. So Who's you, one? Go ahead, Terry. I'm sorry. I was going to say eight teams. Now I, I love, I love what you guys did this year. Yeah. Connecting with the city. And, and yeah. I like what, how you explained it, you know, taking a show on the road and trying to build that fan base. I mean, you, you got, you got one right here. You got two right here. Um, but, uh, we went to Audi stadium. I think it was two years ago. They saw four teams. And that, that was just place. really, really cool. If you were to project in the future and there's no timeline here, what is your goal in regards to expansion? How many teams would you like to have to make this, you know, the thing? Um, it's a good question, man. I think, um, the it's 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 there's two parts to, or there's two or three parts to it the first is like parity yeah um, when you're when you're a league an emerging league right you want the games to be as competitive as possible why because more people watch for longer the more people that watch for longer um the more engagement and then you can go and monetize that engagement with your network partner with sponsors sell more tickets people know that when they watch game they watch something's close the fastest way for any sport to have to change the channel is for them to, for them to be, you know, a blowout game. People just turn it off. Right. People don't yeah. have something interesting about that. Right. Um, so parody is like in competition is really important. Um, the second thing is, you know, in a tour model, we get business efficiencies where we can bring everyone in our staff and all of our production, our partners at ESPN to one location. Whereas if you shot and you have more teams, you have to create a couple different tours. Um, you have to spread those those resources to multiple locations. So um, there's cost in that. There's operational complexity in that. Um, and, and you can't sort of like do bulk negotiation pricing to go into one location. F1 does that really well. They're really good at like getting cities to pay for the whole show to come to them, right? Yeah. So there's part of that as well as negotiating with cities to bring this you know, business uh, for an entire extended weekend to their market, which creates a lot of tourism value. Businesses are supported. Hotels are full, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You lose that. Um, the third piece is at, a, at the league, uh, we don't get a lot of uh, P&L value mm -hmm. for more teams right now. Um, and so uh, you meaning like if you if we were a trade association like the NBA, or just let's take the WNBA, for example. They just sold the, the rights to Toronto a day or, day or so ago. The news just broke today. $151 million or something. Guess where that money goes? Back to all the owners. If we just start another team, we're not selling it to anyone. So there's no monetary event, right? right? So what we're doing <clears throat> is adding cost to the business. And then you're potentially uh, driving less parity to the competition on the field. Water and down. I think that when our expansion really ramps is when we move into a place of, you know, selling teams and, and moving more towards that model. Um, and, you know, the last piece I'd say is like, we're still, it's pro sports. It's no one likes to say this. So I'll be the bad guy and say it, but it's, you know, rosters, are, you're not guaranteed a roster spot because you're good in college. Um, we've done things like build the championship series, which we've done in DC or, or Springfield, Virginia last two years, which is, out of season tournament, top four teams make it sixes style. There's been a lot of because sixes is the Olympic style. Um, there's been a lot of like guys who have gotten a shot at those rosters because there's no long poles, there's no face off guys. Um, so I think it's about trying to thread the needle. I gave you all the business cases, but also knowing that there are a lot of good players out there. Yeah. Um, and trying to find more more slots and opportunities for those guys. Yeah. How how was your draft? You're, you're going to expand. I know it. you're going to expand. You got three teams Absolutely. in the West. You know. You got five on the East Coast, basically. You're gonna. I know it's grow. It's a growing sport. Yeah, How'd you feel yeah. about your draft last week? It's great. Was it man. last Our, week or the week before? Two weeks ago. Wait. Yeah, yeah it's all good. Two weeks ago. Um, it's a really, really attractive uh, draft class. I don't think we've had <coughs> as many stars at drafted um, for a while. Um, I mean, it's just chock full of stars, right? You got. Uh, Brennan O'Neill, who's, you know, a generational talent, uh, Duke, you got, uh, Schellenberger, who's kind of like this, 
um, laser laser focused, a smooth player from UVA, all time scorer. And you have you know Kavanaugh, Pat Kavanaugh, who's you know a fan favorite in the entire lacrosse ecosystem. Go to Boston, drop down to six, which was crazy to me. Um, then you got Liam Edelman, the, the goalie for who's a, probably a generational talent in goal uh, from Notre Dame. Um, and so what I thought was interesting was that team, the GMs were really focused and coaches on finding the right fit <clears throat> for their team rather than just trying to grab names. Um, and that's why you saw like this variation of, of guys moving around. Like the yeah. New York Adams had a guy who retired a goalie who's uh, Jack Kincannon is a great guy who retired this year after like nine years playing and they had a goalie slot. So they, you know, use their early draft pick to go Drafting after lean. For me. Yeah. For yeah, me. yeah. So um, I thought it was great overall. I'm excited. You know, uh, there's like the final four coming up this weekend. Um, and there'll be a bunch for, for, you know, I think it's, it's Denver, UVA, uh, Notre Dame and who's the Maryland. And so there's, there's a bunch of guys who are going to be in the league next, uh, this, uh, coming on J uh, June 1st playing this weekend. So it'll be good, good to get more eyeballs on them. Is that tug at your heartstrings when you hear Maryland? <laughs> A little bit, man. Yeah. I'm I mean, my parents are still there. So uh They're down in the I village still, right? Still in the village, still the same house I grew up in. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. Yeah, God bless them. Wow. Yeah, I know. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, so yeah, man, I'm excited. I'm excited for this. I'd love to get you guys out to a game, especially when we were in Baltimore. Um, tickets on me. Love to get I'll get you guys some merch too. Uh, <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Since you want to ask that last question, I know I, I want to let Michael go here. He's been more than generous with his time. I have two last questions, but <laughs> uh, you could you could mention this briefly because I think we would be remiss if we did not mention your brother at all. Uh, yeah. The way of the champion, pain persistence. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, yeah, uh, guys. If you haven't read the book, you got to get it. It's everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> Mike's brother Paul who played in the league and is co-owner with him. But uh, is there anything you want to share about the book, your brother, anything that we'd like uh, the fans to know here? Yeah, yeah, man. Paul, Paul's a product of uh, Montgomery Village too, man. So, um, and I, you know, I, I think he's the best lacrosse player to ever play. People like to uh, debate that, but that's why sports is great. You can debate things. Um, but look at his resume. Look what he did. Yeah. Um, He's a champion. And I think that the book, he wanted to write a book because he drew on a lot of other inspirations to build not only a career as a multiple multiple time champion in college and pro and international stage, but also, you know, really focusing on building this business. And, you know, we're far from champions at building this business. We're far from, you know, saying like we're successful, I think. Um, but we work really hard and we try really hard. And um, we're building something special. We know that. And I think that the book is taking advice and snippets and case studies from a lot of other champions and people who have had massive success in their respective fields, putting it all into three different separate buckets of, you know, growing up, playing sports and your professional. Yeah. And then it's just, it's like a really cool book that you can constantly go back to. Oh. Um, if you're looking for a pick me up, you can read the table of contents and it's just a way to get like snippets of wisdom. And he did it with Ryan holiday. who's obviously a great author. Um, and it's just, I, I'm proud of him. I had nothing to do with it. Um, I, you know, I'm proud of, of the work I, I've read the book. Um, and I thought it was better than, than, than I was expecting. So I uh, appreciate yeah. bringing it up. Sorry. Yeah. Thank I you. Actually, for that. I followed you guys on <clears throat> social media and I saw his one post about when he was in high school, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think a freshman or something, he was at a camp and a coach said, I will tell you how to uh, make your way in any college you want. All you have to do is a hundred shots every day. And, and just the video that was created for that was awesome. That was awesome. I know that was, that's included in the book there somewhere. Michael, I but, watched the, I watched the, uh, what was like the 30 for 30 on your brother. That was, that was an amazing piece on him. Uh, just brought such a smile to my face. Cause I remember your brother as a freshman, and man, I wanted him to play football so bad. And, and I, I know he had medical issue with his ear. And your mom and dad were yeah. like, "No, you're not doing that. It's not happening." <laughs> and I was like, so "Seriously, Paul? Come oh, on, man. man. He yeah. would have been ridiculous." So I know. He, he Bill Belichick ridiculous. tried to get him to try out. I was with him a couple times, and Bill talked to him about it. 
Um, he wanted him to try out for the Patriots, but he ended up focusing on uh, on lacrosse and probably wouldn't even be here able to talk to you guys if, if he didn't make that decision, a hard decision just to go. He wanted to be the best in a sport rather than, you know, trying to eke, eke his way into a, a roster spot in another. So, yeah. So thank you so much for being here. The one last thing is uh, we're very passionate about sports, especially I, I am about lacrosse, especially because my son plays any final any words of wisdom you have for our listeners who may be young, inspiring lacrosse players? Yeah, I would say that this goes for lacrosse players or anyone playing any sport or frankly, anything you're doing is, um, you know, I lost a lot of uh, a lot of football games in college, um, a ton. And I, and I wish I won more, obviously. Um, and finally, Dartmouth's back to winning. But um I won a lot of, I was fortunate enough to win a fair amount of lacrosse games in high school, but I think about the lessons I learned and I see from the guys in the PLL, uh, if I could distill into one thing is, um, uh, leaving it all on the field and, and truly like, if you are giving it everything you have, uh, and I used to tell myself this before games, no matter if we won or lost, I could you know, hold my head high. Um, and I think that that is something that, um, you can see when a player is out there um, playing whatever sport he or she is playing. And you can tell the ones who really leave it all on the line, really like le exhaust themselves and it's out there. And I think the outcome matters less. And I think the lessons from being a great teammate, doing everything you can um, to try to win, um, doing your best, getting better every week, all those things are sort of summarized and leaving it all on the field. So that's the advice I always try to give is just like, it focus less on the outcome and focus more on just leaving everything you have on the field and you will walk out off that field or court with your head held high. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, Michael, I'm going to, I'm going to thank you again for, for just making some time. I know you and I have been trying to connect for a couple of years. Yeah, man. Uh, to Sorry. It took me so long. No, <laughs> it, it, no apologies necessary. I know what you're doing. Uh, I am so proud of you and Paul in the direction you've gone. Um, your parents are incredible people for raising two young men like you guys. Um, I, I truly honored that I got to coach you guys. I, I do brag about it to our lacrosse kids. I'm like, you know, I don't really know shit about lacrosse, but the one thing I know is I coached the Rabel brothers many moons ago. They did. Like, really? And I'm like, yeah, kind of, you know? Yeah, yeah, you did. But, uh, I appreciate that, man. And, and the one thing I want to do is I want to thank you. I had, this is probably like three years ago. I had a young man whose uh, parents got separated and it was really hard on this kid. And he's a big time lacrosse kid. And I, I hit you up and Paul made a nice video for this kid. And if people don't understand uh, what a great, what a great person, an athlete, professional athlete, and a person like Paul can be, um, you know, Paul sent him that. And it was just an amazing thing. You know, the kid really took it to heart and it meant so much to him. So, um, you know, that that just shows you guys are good people. You're not just professional lacrosse players or you don't own an organization that, you know, you, you get where I'm coming from. I don't need to spill yeah, my guts there. No, so, I appreciate, um, appreciate you sharing that story. It means a lot. I think, um, you know, I remember you asking me that, but uh, I, I had forgotten it. And appreciate you bringing that up. And, you know, Paul, um, we try to really, really spend our time um, with with people that hopefully we can make an impact. And, and frankly, like you made an impact on me, coach. So um, if we, uh, that that those I have endless amount of favors back for you. So um, I'm just glad you're you're still in the ecosystem, still pushing, using your voice, um, and inspiring the next generation. So anything we can do to help, man, I appreciate it. And I appreciate your story and, and and allowing me to jump on your show. And good to meet you, Terry. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Here's a little awesome. inside. Terry's my nephew, uh, Michael. <laughs> Is he? <laughs> He's my nephew. His mom's wow. about. His mom's 18 years older than me, so we grew up like brothers. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Hey, Michael. Thanks again. I'm gonna right, I'm gonna fellas. put you backstage so we can wrap up and uh, we can sure. chat for a few minutes afterwards. So thanks yeah, again. Yeah. That'd be great. Awesome. Hey. Oh my God. Like that was. That's amazing. Incredible. You know, you're talking to somebody who is the, you know, the, the, his business is growing in leaps and bounds, him and his brother, because of a lot of reasons, but they think their way through each and everything they do to make sure the next step is going to be the successful step. And I'm sure they, 
I'm sure somewhere along the line they've hit snags. I know we didn't get into that, but I didn't want to get into that. I wanted a positive, just a positive outcome from him, and, and that's that's what we built. There it was it was just fun to talk to him after 20 years, to be honest with you. Yeah, you could tell they do have a solid business plan, but the at the heart of it, they're people centric, and that's yeah. what they have the best interest in mind right now. And so it was really cool. And uh, I can't, man, I got goosebumps talking to him. <laughs> that was he's just a, listen, the great family, mom and dad. Uh, Paul's tell. a great young man. Um, you know, I, I can't say enough positive things. Hey, let me wrap this up for us. I, I'm so excited that we got to do this finally with Michael. Uh, connect with us here on the Original Sports Podcast by checking out our webpage, uh, podpage.com, Original Sports Podcast with Mark Meriday. Uh, like our Facebook page. Uh, check us out on X. I can't say Twitter anymore because it's not Twitter anymore. Um, you know, and, and reach us on Snapchat. All of those are OSP with Eminem. You can also follow us on Instagram. You can check out our TikToks, and you can watch all of our episodes. Uh, all of that stuff is Original Sports Podcast. Um, I'd like to give a shout-out to our networks that we are part of, the Let's Talk Sports Network, Sideline Sports Net, uh, Elite Sports and Entertainment Network, which is ESEN. We also are on Tuesday nights from 9 to 10 on Roku on the ESEN channel. Hey, feel free to let us know if you have any comments, questions, even suggestions for a potential future guest by emailing us at originalsportspodcast at gmail.com. Uh, big shout out to our guy, Steve Medley, for doing our voice intro, uh, Charlie Hodgson for doing our music. Join us on Sunday, you guys. This Sunday, May 26th, we will be doing a live show from McClintock's Distillery. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you.